Chapter 25 We now found ourselves in the wide and desolate Antarctic Ocean, in a latitude exceeding 84 degrees, in a frail canoe, and with no provision but the three turtles. The long polar winter, too, could not be considered as far distant, and it became necessary that we should deliberate well upon the course to be pursued. There were six or seven islands in sight belonging to the same group, and distant from each other about five or six leagues, but upon neither of these had we any intention to venture. In coming from the northward in the Jane Guy, we had been gradually leaving behind us the severest regions of ice. This, however, little it may be in accordance with the generally received notions respecting the Antarctic, was a fact experience would not permit us to deny. To attempt, therefore, getting back would be folly, especially at so late a period of the season. Only one course seemed to be left open for hope. We resolved to steer boldly to the southward, where there was at least a probability of discovering other lands, and more than a probability of finding a still milder climate. So far we had found the Antarctic, like the Arctic Ocean, peculiarly free from violent storms or immoderately rough water. But our canoe was, at best, a frail structure. Although large, and we set busily to work with a view of rendering her as safe as the limited means in our possession would admit, the body of the boat was of no better material than bark. The bark was of a tree unknown. The ribs were of a tough osier, well adapted to the purpose for which it was used. We had fifty feet room from stem to stern, from four to six in breadth, and in depth throughout four feet and a half, the boats thus differing vastly in shape from those of any other inhabitants of the southern ocean with whom civilized nations are acquainted. We never did believe them the worksmanship of the ignorant islanders who owned them, and some days after this period discovered, by questioning our captive, that they were in fact made by the natives of a group to the southwest of the country where we found them, having fallen accidentally into the hands of our barbarians. What we could do for the security of our boat was very little indeed. Several wide rents were discovered near both ends, and these we contrived to patch up with the pieces of woolen jacket. With the help of the superfluous paddles, of which there were a great many, we erected a kind of framework about the bow so as to break the force of any seas which might threaten to fill us in that quarter. We also set up two paddle blades for masts, placing them opposite each other, one by each gunwale, thus saving the necessity of a yard. To these masts we attached a sail made of our shirts, doing this with some difficulty, as here we could get no assistance from our prisoner whatever, although he had been willing enough to labor in all the other operations. The sight of the linen seemed to affect him in a very singular manner. He could not be prevailed upon to touch it or go near it, shuddering when we attempt to force him, and shrieking out, Tekalili! Having completed our arrangements in regard to the security of the canoe, we now set sail to the south-southeast for the present, with the view of weathering the most southerly of the group in sight. This being done, we turned the bow full to the southward. The weather could by no means be considered disagreeable. We had a prevailing and very gentle wind from the northward, a smooth sea, and continual daylight. No ice whatever was to be seen, nor did I ever see one particle of this after leaving the parallel of Bennett's Island. Indeed, the temperature of the water was here far too warm for its existence in any quantity. Having killed the largest of our tortoises, and obtained from him not only food, but a copious supply of water, we continued on our course, without any incident of moment, for perhaps seven or eight days, during which period we must have proceeded a vast distance to the southward, as the wind blew constantly with us, and a very strong current set continually in the direction we were pursuing. March 1st. Many unusual phenomena now indicated that we were entering upon a region of novelty and wonder. A high range of light gray vapor appeared constantly in the southern horizon, flaring up occasionally in lofty streaks, now darting from east to west, now from west to east, and again presenting a level of uniform summit in, short, having all the wild variations of the aurora borealis. 
The average height of this vapor, as apparent from our station, was about 25 degrees. The temperature of the sea seemed to be increasing momentarily, and there was a very perceptible alteration in its color. March 2nd. Today, by repeated questioning of our captive, we came to the knowledge of many particulars in regard to the island of the massacre, its inhabitants, and customs. But with these, how can I now detain the reader? I may say, however, that we learned there were eight islands in the group, that they were governed by a common king named Salmon or Salmoon, who resided in one of the smallest of the islands, that the black skins forming the dresses of the warriors came from an animal of huge size, to be found only in a valley near the court of the king, that the inhabitants of the group fabricated no other boats than the flat-bottomed rafts, the four canoes being all of the kind in their possession, and these having been obtained by mere accident from some large island in the southwest, that his own name was Nunu, that he had no knowledge of Bennett's Islet, and that the appellation of the island he had left was Tesala. The commencement of the words Salmon and Salal was given with a prolonged hissing sound, which we found it impossible to imitate, even after repeated endeavors, and which was precisely the same with the note of the black bittern we had eaten up on the summit of the hill. March 3rd. The heat of the water was now truly remarkable, and in color was undergoing a rapid change, being no longer transparent, but of a milky consistency and hue. In our immediate vicinity it was usually smooth, never so rough as to endanger the canoe, but we were frequently surprised at perceiving, to our right and left at different distances, sudden and extensive agitations of the surface. These we at length noticed were always preceded by wild flickerings in that region of vapor to the southward. March 4th. Today, with the view of widening our cell, the breeze from the northward dying away perceptibly. I took from my coat pocket a white handkerchief. Nunu was seated at my elbow, and the linen accidentally flaring in his face, he became violently affected with convulsions. These were succeeded by drowsiness and stupor, and low murmurings of Tekalili, Tekalili. March 5th. The wind had entirely ceased, but it was evident that we were still hurrying on to the southward under the influence of a powerful current. And now, indeed, it would seem reasonable that we should experience some alarm at the turn of events were taking, but we felt none. The continents of Peters indicated nothing of this nature, although it wore at times an expression I could not fathom. The polar winter appeared to be coming on, but coming without its terrors. I felt a numbness of body and mind, a dreaminess of sensation, but this was all. March 6. The gray vapor had now arisen many more degrees above the horizon, and was gradually losing its grayness of tint. The heat of the water was extreme, even unpleasant to the touch, and its milky hue was more evident than ever. Today a violent agitation of the water occurred very close to the canoe. It was attended as usual, with a wild flaring up the vapor at its summit, and a momentary division at its base. A fine white powder, resembling ashes but certainly not, fell over the canoe and over a large surface of the water, as the flickering died away among the vapor and the commotion subsided in the sea. Nunu now threw himself on his face in the bottom of the boat, and no persuasions could induce him to arise. March 7th. This day we questioned Nunu concerning the motives of his countrymen in destroying our companions, but he appeared to be too utterly overcome by terror to afford us any rational reply. He still obstinately lay in the bottom of the boat, and upon reiterating the questions as to the motive, made use only of idiotic gesticulations, such as raising with his forefinger the upper lip and displaying the teeth which lay beneath it. These were black. We had never before seen the teeth of an inhabitant of Salal. March 8th. Today there floated by us one of the white animals whose appearance upon the beach at Salal had occasioned so wild a commotion among the savages. I would have picked it up, but there came over me a sudden listlessness, and I forbore. The heat of the water still increased, and the hand could no longer be endured within it. Peters spoke little, and I knew not what to think of his apathy. Nunu breathed, 
and no more. March 9th. The whole ashy material fell now continually around us, and in vast quantities. The range of vapor to the southward had risen prodigiously in the horizon, and began to assume more distinctness of form. I can liken it to nothing but a limitless cataract, rolling silently into the sea from some immense and far distant rampart in the heaven. The gigantic curtain ranged along the whole extent of the southern horizon. It emitted no sound. March 21st. A sullen darkness now hovered above us, but from the milky depths of the ocean a luminous glare arose and stole up along the bulwarks of the boat. We were nearly overwhelmed by the white ashy shower which settled upon us and upon the canoe, but melted into the water as it fell. The summit of the cataract was utterly lost in the dimness and the distance. Yet we were evidently approaching it with a hideous velocity. At intervals there were visible in it wide, yawning, but momentary rents, and from out these rents within which was a chaos of flittering and indistinct images, there came a rushing and mighty, but soundless winds, tearing up the enkindled ocean in their course. March 22nd. The darkness had materially increased, relieved only by the glare of the water thrown back from the white curtain before us. Many gigantic and pallidly white birds flew continuously now from beyond the veil, and their scream was the eternal Tekalili, as they retreated from our vision. Hereupon Nunu stirred in the bottom of the boat, but upon touching him we found his spirit departed. And now we rushed into the embrace of the cataract, where the chasm threw itself open to receive us. But there arose in our pathway a shrouded human figure, very far larger in its proportions than any dweller among men, and the hue of the skin of the figure was of the perfect whiteness of snow. Note. The circumstances connected with the late sudden and distressing death of Mr. Pym are already well known to the public through the medium of the daily press. It is feared that the few remaining chapters which were to have completed his narrative, and which were retained by him, while the above were in type for the purpose of revision, have been irrecoverably lost through the accident by which he perished himself. This, however, may prove not to be the case, and the papers, if ultimately found, will be given to the public. No means have been left untried to remedy this deficiency. The gentleman whose name is mentioned in the preface, and who, from the statement there made, might be supposed to fill the vacuum, has declined the task this, for satisfactory reasons connected with the general inaccuracy of the details afforded him, and his disbelief in the entire truth of the later portions of the narration. Peters, from whom some information might be expected, is still alive, and a resident of Illinois, but can not be met with at present. He may hereafter be found, and will no doubt afford material for a conclusion of Mr. Pym's account. The loss of two or three final chapters, for there were but two or three, is the more deeply to be regretted, as it cannot be doubted they contained matter relative to the pole itself, or at least to regions in its very near proximity, and as too the statements of the author in relation to these regions may shortly be verified or contradicted by means of the governmental expedition now preparing for the southern ocean. On one point in the narrative, some remarks may well be offered, and it would afford the writer of this appendix much pleasure if what he may here observe should be tendency to throw credit, in any degree, upon the very singular pages now published. We allude to the chasms found in the island of Salal, and to the whole of the figures upon pages 245 through 47 of the printed edition. Note, no figures were included with this text. Mr. Pym has given the figures of the chasms without comment, and speaks decidedly of the indentures found at the extremity of the most easterly of these chasms, as having but a fanciful resemblance to alphabetical characters, and, in short, as being positively not such. This assertion is made in a manner so simple, and sustained by a species of demonstration so conclusive, viz. the fitting of the projections of the fragments found among the dust into the indentures upon the wall, that we are forced to believe the writer in earnest, and no reasonable reader should suppose otherwise. But as the facts in relation to all the figures are most singular, especially when taken in connection with statements made in the body of the narrative, it may be as well to say a word or two concerning them all, 
This, too, the more especially as the facts in question have, beyond doubt, escaped the attention of Mr. Poe. Figure 1, then figure 2, figure 3, and figure 5, when conjoined with one another in the precise order which the chasms themselves presented, and when deprived of the small lateral branches or arches, eh, which it will be remembered served only as a means of communication between the main chambers, and were of totally distinct character, constitute an Ethiopian verbal root, the root to be shady, whence all the inflections of shadow or darkness. In regard to the left or most northwardly of the indentures in figure four, it is more than probable that the opinion of Peters was correct, and that the hieroglyphical appearance was really the work of art, and intended as the representation of a human form. The delineation is before the reader, and he may or may not perceive the resemblance suggested, but the rest of the indentures afford strong confirmation of Peter's idea. The upper range is evidently the Arabic verbal root, to be white, whence all the inflections of brilliancy and whiteness. The lower range is not so immediately persistious. The characters are somewhat broken and disjointed. Nevertheless, it cannot be doubted that, in their perfect state, they formed the full Egyptian word, the region of the south. It should be observed that these interpretations confirm the opinion of Peters in regard to the most northwardly of the figures. The arm is outstretched toward the south. Conclusions such as these open a wide field for speculation and exciting conjecture. They should be regarded, perhaps, in connection with some of the most faintly detailed incidents of the narrative, although in no visible manner is this chain of connection complete. Tekalili was the cry of the affrighted natives of Salal upon discovering the carcass of the white animal picked up at sea. This was also the shuddering exclamatives of Salal upon discovering the carcass of the white materials in possession of Mr. Pym. This was also the shriek of the swift-flying, white and gigantic birds which issued from the vapory white curtain of the south. Nothing white was to be found at Salal, and nothing otherwise in the subsequent voyage to the region beyond. It is not impossible that Salal, the appellation of the islands of the chasms, may be found, upon minute psychological scrutiny, to betray either some alliance with the chasms themselves, or some reference to the Ethiopian characters so mysteriously written in their windings. I have graven it within the hills, and my vengeance upon the dust within the rock.